Hello and welcome to Weymouth Independent Evangelical Church. This is our latest online sermon. We're still unable to meet together uh, as we would normally like, but trust that the Lord will bless us as we look at his word. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 and we're continuing our series from this letter. And we'll find Paul returning to a familiar theme. In the letter we've seen plenty of rejoicing that he's expressed. He's rejoiced at the unity that he feels with the Philippians, that he's encouraging in them. He's encouraged and rejoicing in the growth in their faith and growth in the work of the gospel. Even though he's in prison, he's seen how many have been encouraged and emboldened to tell forth of Jesus Christ, the only saviour. And so he's been full of rejoicing. And so as we turn to verse one, we find him encouraging that again, but with an important twist in that command for them to rejoice. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now we might automatically think, finally, he's coming to an end, but actually he's only halfway through the letter. I think it's to un- we should understand it more in terms of, furthermore, keep on going, keep on rejoicing in the Lord to the very end. Finally, make that your final outlook in life, to rejoice and to rejoice in the Lord. That's the critical part. That's the the step further that he takes, not just to rejoice in your circumstances, whatever's happening, but to rejoice in the Lord and how much they would need to do that because of the things that he's going to write to them next, warning them about the environment in which they would be pursuing their ministry, growing in their fellowship, in the context of those who would bring false teaching and disunity and a shrinking back from the truths of the gospel. How important it was for Paul to express to them the need to beware. And the answer to all of the problems that would be coming would be in the Lord, in the righteousness and the right standing before God that he alone can bring. So their faith must be firmly centred on him. Their outlook must be to find joy and meaning and confidence in the Lord and all that he had done and not in themselves, not in what these other teachers were telling them to put their confidence in. So that's going to be the main theme. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And he goes on for me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Maybe we've heard Paul saying several times about rejoicing and he's got more to say about rejoicing. And it's as if he's saying that that's absolutely fine. I can never stop telling people to rejoice how readily we would become despondent and despair and turn in on ourselves. when the answer to all of our circumstances, all of the threats that may be against our faith is to turn to the Lord and hear his truth and have that applied to our hearts as we preach that word to ourselves. That's how they're going to be safe to the very end. And it then goes on to make some very surprising uh, and strong worded exhortations and warnings to them. Verse two, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. He's obviously got some specific people in mind as he says these things. Beware of dogs. It's not a a warning that we might see uh, put up for the benefit of postmen. Uh, Dogs in our circumstance, in our context, are often seen as man's best friend and people spend a lot of time pampering their dogs in our culture. But that's completely foreign to the culture of the Greeks. The dogs were those who, who were threatening and wild and unpredictable and outside of normal society and certainly that's the term that had been used of those who were not Jewish of Jewish heritage the Jews would say of the Gentiles they are Gentile dogs they are outside of God's purposes and yet Christ had come and Paul who once probably would have said that was now delighted to tell the Gentiles of the gospel that included them in God's purposes you are welcome into God's kingdom he would preach through faith in Jesus Christ, who has come to be the saviour of all the nations, all the people groups. It doesn't matter where you were born or what nation you were born into. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Submit to him and find God's favour. Find a right standing with God. 
before him. I hope you understand that in the days where race and nationality in our own time are so, such important issues. In Christ Jesus, we find the defining moment of humanity. We are either, according to the Bible, in Christ, in the new creation, the new humanity that he brings in, or we are in Adam, uh, cut off from God, under God's condemnation and wrath. We're all born into that state in Adam, in sin, under God's condemnation, but by the work of the Holy Spirit, we can be brought by faith into that new humanity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in him we are to rejoice. But some of these people who'd come to recognise Jesus Christ as the Saviour were still caught up with their old way of thinking and were insisting that Gentile believers, to be fully acceptable to God, must comply with all of the strict requirements of the Jewish law, denying that Christ had fulfilled all of these in his life and death and resurrection, so that these stipulations and regulations of the law were no longer required of believers. And yet they would go around the churches of the Gentiles saying, yes, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but show that you're truly acceptable to God by being circumcised. That seemed to be the main point of conflict. The main hallmark of genuine spirituality was whether you'd been circumcised or not. That covenant that was made between God and Abraham to show that uh, he, he would be faithful to his promises to Abraham to bless him and bless the world through his offspring. That covenant sign was given um, but fulfilled in Christ, who on our behalf was cut off from God, so that we might be acceptable in God's sight. And so that's why Paul is being very stark. Beware of the mutilation. Those who insist that we, you must cut off a piece of the flesh to be acceptable to God. He's very strong. They are evil workers. They think they're so acceptable and religious and righteous in God's sight because of their zealous zeal for the Lord. But actually they are working what is evil because they are taking away from God's plan of salvation. They are decrying the accomplishments of Christ on the cross. They're saying it's not enough, you need a bit more. And though the issue now for most of us listening to this is not whether we've been circumcised or how readily humans would bring in Additions, oh, you must have this experience. You must have had this ritual as well as faith in Christ to really be acceptable to God. Now, the, the rituals and signs in themselves are, are not wrong, but they're never to be given such an emphasis that they in any way undermine the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. It's his righteousness that counts. And that's the discovery that Paul had made in his own conversion experience and why he was so passionate to convey to these believers here and more vehemently perhaps to those in Galatia who had been very influenced by the teaching of the circumcisers, the Judaizers as they're sometimes called. And Paul was passionately opposed, passionately equipping the church to withstand any falsehood. And he goes on uh, to give the positive first of all. He says, verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. It doesn't matter what's happened to bits of our body, it's what's happened on the inside. Circumcision was only ever an external sign of what had happened in the heart of those Old Testament believers, that they'd been set apart by God, for God, uh, to, to serve God, to be holy in his sight, set apart to be worshippers of God who worship in spirit, not through ritual, not by law adherence or any other misinterpretation of God's purposes of how men might be right in his sight. It's through God's sovereign work to save a people for himself, to set them apart through faith in Jesus Christ and that's why true believers have no confidence in what they have done, who they are, what background they have, confidence in the flesh, no they have rejoicing, confidence, joy 
in Christ Jesus. He is everything. What he has done is the sole basis for hope and security of the new identity that we have. And Paul reflects how easily it, it is to get that wrong. Rather than having confidence in Christ, who is holy and accomplished salvation for us, to rather have confidence in ourselves, to have confidence in the flesh, what we have done, who we are. Paul's view of God had been radically changed when he met Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. And he realised that he was putting confidence in his flesh. He spoke grand things about God and his commitment to God, but actually it was all serving himself and not God. He goes on to list some of the credentials that he would have boasted of in his former life, but that now he has completely turned things around in his estimation of them. And he uses the sort of language that you might expect an accountant to be using. An accountant who would list all of the assets, all of the things that were gain of profit on one side and all the liabilities on another column and balance those out to work out whether there was a profit overall or a loss. What was the bottom line? And Paul has come to realise that those things that he was trusting in as great spiritual assets, let's see some of those from verse 4 onwards, though I also, Paul says, might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He's front of the queue when it comes to confidence in the flesh, he's saying. And this is why, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day, tick, Spot on, absolutely right procedure, right ritual, just as God commanded. Of the stock of Israel, born as a Hebrew. Of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the favoured tribes, uh, those southern kingdoms of Israel latterly. Uh, A Hebrew of the Hebrews. His parents were of the right stock too. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. They were... Uh, The ones who were looked up to in terms of their adherence to the law, their knowledge of what it was that God had revealed, how his people should live. And the Pharisees were sticklers for sticking to that. They took the law and they uh, made all sorts of other rules and regulations to fence that law around, lest anyone get anywhere near transgressing it. And the focus of their spirituality became upon whether you had adhered to all of those different man-made regulations. But certainly their reputation was for lawfulness. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was passionate to uphold the traditions of the bygone ages to such a point that that which threatened it, and that's how he viewed the church, these followers of Jesus Christ, he viewed them as threatening the temple, threatening the law, threatening the traditions. And so he put his utmost effort into opposing that, to persecuting them to ensuring that uh, at pain of death people would stop proclaiming Jesus Christ as the long-promised Messiah, whom he saw as such a threat. He persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, Paul is saying, not saying here he was perfect, but he's saying there was no way anyone could point a finger at him that he'd broken some of the laws or some of those Pharisaic regulations. He was blameless. But here's his conclusion. Here's Paul doing the maths. But what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Not not only has he come to see that these things were of no use in making him right to God, with God, he sees that they're actually transferred to the liabilities column. An emphasis on these things were taking him further away from God further away from the profit of righteousness, if we might say. They they were dragging him down because he was so taken up with himself and his own efforts, rather than giving glory to God for his enabling of any good works in his sight. A complete transformation in his outlook when he met Jesus Christ in all his glory and fell before him and worshipped him and realised that all that he had put his trust in was worse than worthless it was actually the basis of which 
on which God could condemn him for his self-righteousness. He's counted them loss for Christ. He goes further, verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He'd spent his whole life building himself up into this rabbi, this teacher, this someone in the eyes of the Jewish law and his fellow Jews. He now realised that that was dung, that was rubbish, that was to be taken out and done away with because he'd met Jesus Christ, who is the fulfilment of all of the law. All that the prophets were pointing to, all that Moses spoke of, was pointing forward to the need for and the sufficiency of a saviour who would stand in the place of sinners and whose righteousness would be counted to those sinners simply when they put their trust in him. And that's a challenge for us, isn't it? So readily we would have a religious outlook. It's sometimes described as the default mode of the human heart is to be religious. You may be surprised about that. Yes, uh, we too often switch on that automatic mode of just pleasing ourselves. But so readily to when we feel a sorrow and a guilt over that, we think that being religious is going to solve that. And Paul and countless others have can testify that being religious doesn't make you right with God. Are you trusting in the things that you have done, who you are, the country that you've been born in, who your parents were, whatever it may be, are you trusting in those to make you acceptable to God? In your church attendance, albeit that we've not been able to do that in the past few months because of restrictions, but maybe you've been uh, extra keen to tune in to other places and get all the teaching that you can. But that doesn't make you right with God. Only a living, active faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is acceptable before God. As you are going through faith, come into union with Christ and all that he's accomplished, will God smile upon you and view you with that favour that rests only on the righteous. And that's his longing, isn't it? He counts the things that were liabilities, as he realises now, the things that were lost to him, he counts them as rubbish. And his desire now is, verse 9, to be found in him, in Christ Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That's how you can be righteous before God, acceptable to him through faith from God, faith in Jesus Christ, fully resting your whole soul, body, mind, your whole eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. What confidence then that brings before God, the holy God, before whom we would otherwise cringe because his holiness would find us out, expose our sin, expose our hypocrisy, expose our self-interest and self-righteousness, our self-justification. But when we plead Christ and his blood that was shed in our place, his death taking the sin that uh, we had done, then what confidence that we can have. The Son of God pleading for us, granted access into his Father's presence. Who's telling you otherwise? Who, who are you listening to? Paul is clear about being aware of being aware of those who would give false messages. And sometimes that can be ourselves. Are we aware of the dangers that we're in? Of false messages? Of a false righteousness before God? Let's heed this encouragement, this exhortation from Paul. Rejoice in the Lord. That's not about feeling happy and uh, constantly having a smile on your face. You know, true joy comes from a confidence before God, uh, living out that faith in his sight and knowing his smile upon us. Whatever we may face, whatever we may have done, as we come humbly before him. 
That's something that's a daily experience, isn't it? To rejoice in the Lord because of what he has done for us. Let's make it that our habit. And especially perhaps when we are feeling threatened, feeling down, feeling estranged from fellow believers perhaps, when our unity is threatened, when there seems to be no growth either for ourselves or in our churches. Let's make it our business to turn to the Lord, to rejoice in him, to be thankful to him. And Paul's got plenty more to say about that. Rejoice then in the Lord today, tomorrow, and until you join with the hordes of heaven, rejoicing in his very presence. What a joyful day that will be. Press on, brother or sister. And if you can't say that you have any reason to rejoice in the Lord, would you turn to him now and ask that he would show you why Christians rejoice in Jesus Christ and him alone? Pray that he would reveal himself to you, not in a grand vision of glory as it was for Saul, who became Paul on that road to Damascus, but maybe through the convicting work of his Holy Spirit, through the word of God, uh, through the example of another Christian, wherever you are, whoever you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith and find every reason to rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have every reason to rejoice. Though we may be threatened, though we may sometimes look at ourselves and ask questions, how can God accept me? How Satan, your enemy, would delight to accuse Christians of just not being good enough. How could God accept you, he says to us. But we know that as we turn in faith to the Lord time and again, he is sufficient. He is faithful. His blood shed upon the cross is exactly what we need and will pay for each and every sin, past, present and future. And his righteousness endures forever so that all who put their trust in him have that righteousness accounted to us as an eternal righteousness. May we then have that confidence and so daily remind ourselves of the reasons we have to rejoice in the Lord and live for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.